Hello everyone. Thank you for joining today's session. I know today's session is going to be awesome. This is all about LinkedIn. As you all know, LinkedIn is a social networking app, but unlike the Facebook and Twitter, it's mostly being used for the professional purpose. And this is a platform where we can share and showcase our skills, expertise, education, experiences, etc., and also get connected with the recruiters. And, and the LinkedIn profile talks before us and before our resumes. And in this session, Shannon is going to cover how to optimize the LinkedIn profile and presence, and uh, expectations and approaches um, for the social media platform, and uh, and also about understanding the algorithm and uh, how we can increase the engagement on the LinkedIn platform. And before we get started, I would like to uh, talk about a few other impact force sessions that we have done so far. Um, there are a variety of sessions that we have covered. The impact force sessions mostly focus on improving our soft skills. So besides technical skills, there are a couple of other skills that we need to master to grow and elevate in our career. So this series is focused on improving our soft skills. So as part of the series, we have a couple of sessions on networking, building our brand and how to um, present uh, to in Dreamforce or any other community groups and uh, how to overcome imposter syndrome, perseverance, uh, and so many other sessions um, are covered. And you can find all these sessions in the YouTube channel, Trailblazing Together. I will be sharing the link to the YouTube channel in the chat window in a couple of minutes. And today's session as well is going to be recorded and it will be posted on the same YouTube channel. And these are the upcoming sessions. Um, the, one, the one coming up is by Bradley, how to break into Salesforce freelancing. And uh, in May, we have uh, another session by Eric Brushfield about the customer experience. And we also have a nice surprise Mother's Day uh, panel as well. Uh, we are uh, going to announce it soon. Uh, be sure to follow the group, community group, to get notified of all the new uh, new events that we're going to host. And uh, we would love for you to share your key insights uh, from this session. So we want the people who could not attend this session also to learn about uh, the key takeaways from this session. So please uh, share the key takeaways on the Twitter, on the LinkedIn platform as well. And about the swag, uh, we have a swag for everyone. It's not uh, the regular swag that we offer, but it's the LinkedIn success checklist where you all can utilize. And this is a checklist where it is organized by the section wise and where you can compare with your LinkedIn profile and see how uh, how, how good you, is your LinkedIn profile filled in and you can go and take action on your profile. So we're going to share this at the end of the session. Be sure uh, to stay until the end. If you cannot, uh, please reach out to me. I will be able to send, uh, send it to you in the email. And um, just a few housekeeping items. This session is going to be recorded and it, it will be posted to the YouTube channel. And if you have any questions, please post them in the chat window. And also, if you're, please feel free to unmute and um, uh, um, talk directly. And um, as I mentioned, uh, be sure to follow the Trailblazer group to be notified of all the upcoming sessions. And now, without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Shannon. But um, it's a small introduction about Shannon. I know Shannon has a lot of um, accomplishments and um, she's an inspirational person, but it's very hard to put it in a few lines, but I try my best. <laughs> so she is the president and CEO of uh, Cloud Adoption Solutions, and uh, she is very active and um, talks regularly and provides keynote talks, consulting, and workshops on sales productivity. And she has also written a book, It's About Time. And it's being widely used by all the sales teams across the country to focus on what's really important to drive revenue and results. And she has uh, done her PhD recently from uh, Point Park University in community management. She has done her MBA in management and MBA from the University of Pittsburgh. And I think she's the only one now who has a PhD degree. <laughs> and it's an honor to have uh, Shannon with us today. And Shannon, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. I'm going to stop my screen share. You can take it over. 
Great. Thanks, JB. Let me do an audio check and make sure, Rhythm, I can see your face. Can you give me a thumbs up if I sound? Okay, great. Good. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, JB. I'm so pleased to be here with this group. And the first thing I want to do is put you back in 2003. Do you remember 2003? I know a few of you are probably like, 2003? <laughs> I was still in elementary school then. But in 2003, LinkedIn launched. I was so excited about LinkedIn. Now, this was pre-Facebook, right? Like maybe we were on Friendster. <laughs> so the idea of social networking was still very new. It was really nascent. And LinkedIn was a little bit like the wild, wild west, but you knew it was somewhere you had to be. And LinkedIn really became a place where you would say, here is where I'm going to find people professionally, right? So you're thinking about um, a little different, yes, MySpace. I absolutely loved MySpace. My MySpace is still out there. <laughs> um, you're, you're looking at LinkedIn to say, okay, how can I find somebody else in my town who's doing this thing? How can I find prospects? How can I find prospective hiring managers? And in the almost 20 years that it's been, because LinkedIn's almost as old as Salesforce, LinkedIn has really made some very significant changes. So you can search better now. Of course, they monetize the platform because we knew they would do that. So there's loads of different ways that you can pay LinkedIn money. But what I wanna do today is give you some immediately actionable tips and tricks that you can use to look at your LinkedIn profile and say, am I where I want to be? in terms of LinkedIn. Is my LinkedIn presence exactly where it should be? And so I'm gonna lead you through some things. I've got some good examples. And like JB said, your swag for today's events is a beautiful checklist that will take you through step-by-step. Step. Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? So hang on till the end because that checklist is pretty spectacular. I am going to try to share my screen now and I will Click on present. I love Google Slides, y'all. Google Slides are my favorite. Um, again, Rhythm, I can see you. Can you see my screen? Beautiful. Yeah, all good, Shannon. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. So we're going to spend the next couple of minutes together looking at some ways that you can link up with LinkedIn and ways that you can tighten your profile and keep it real. So LinkedIn has got the amazing ability to give you SEO. And we all know about SEO because this is a marketers group, but in case you joined today specifically for this, SEO is search engine optimization. And one of the things that you can really use your LinkedIn profile to do is allow yourself to be found if somebody's Google searching for something. So LinkedIn is its own search engine, but it also feeds into the major search engines. I'm gonna give you some tips today and I want you, if you've got any questions, comments, throw them in the chat. I'm gonna keep my eye on them. JB's gonna keep her eye on them. So if there's anything that we can answer immediately, let's do that. All right, so let's get started. Okay, so the first thing is, and this is often a big elephant in the room when people talk about LinkedIn, is that you're a brand ambassador and LinkedIn is your brand storefront. So if you were going to plug a sign into the street and say, here I am, I'm going to hang my shingle. One of the things that's really confusing about LinkedIn is who are you representing? Do you represent yourself or are you representing your company? Well, your professional brand is a blend of both, isn't it? So you've got to think a little bit about how do I represent my company, especially if you're working for an organization that's got a really public face and you're dealing with customers immediately because they'll go to LinkedIn and say, I want to learn a little bit more about this bill before I return his phone call. Or I want to know a little bit more about Tatiana before I answer her email. So they'll go look for you on LinkedIn, right? Everybody's looking to see, let me check out their LinkedIn presence. So one of the things you have to remember is what you're putting on LinkedIn becomes part of your brand. It is somebody else's perception of you, which then becomes their reality. So one of the things I will encourage you to do is look at the social selling index. Now, I know most of us on this call aren't sellers by title, but we're all sellers all the time, aren't we? You're selling yourself, you're selling what you stand for, you're selling your company. So we're all sort of in sales. <laughs> So you can use this social selling index that LinkedIn has. It's available for free where you can go in and they'll give you four measures that the LinkedIn algorithm thinks are very important for people who are penetrating LinkedIn and the way that they think makes sense. Now, 
I put one of mine up here. I run this about once a quarter just to see, am I doing the things I should be doing to be building relationships on LinkedIn? You, you'll see sort of you've got this overall composite score and that's not really important unless you like vanity metrics. I think that's a vanity metric. What's really important are the four things that it's scoring you on, right? So check those out. One is establish your professional brand. This score is going to say to you, have you filled out your LinkedIn profile? Are all of the sections in order? Have you refreshed them recently? So the algorithm here is looking to see, are you establishing your professional brand on LinkedIn. The next one is find the right people. Are you using that advanced search to say, show me people in Chicago who are Salesforce administrators who have marketing in their title or their description so that I can get to know them, right? So it's looking to see, are you using that search functionality? The next one is engage with insights. This one is the challenge. This is the one that takes the time, but it pays off the best. So when you're following people and you'll know that LinkedIn in their, um, in their feed gives you the ability in the top right hand corner to toggle between top posts or recent posts. I usually re toggle it because I don't like LinkedIn to tell me what they think my top post should be based on who else is engaging in them. So I like to see what's going on in recent posts, but you can toggle that back and forth. And if somebody's posted something that you think is amazing, Let's see, they say that JB posted this and she said, you know, here's our next session. It's with Bradley and it's going to be focused on, you know, how you can become a freelancer in the Salesforce ecosystem. She posted it, and if you post underneath it, hey, JB, so excited to come to this session. Here are two things I hope to get out of it. What it's going to do is reward you on the Engage with Insights caption. And it's also going to promote JB's post back up in the algorithm. So LinkedIn's looking for those sort of insights and that's why they're scoring you on it. So they're rewarding you for that sort of thing. And the last one is build relationships. I guarantee if I asked you to raise your hands, if you've ever had somebody slide into your LinkedIn DMs and immediately start to pitch you before they've built a relationship, you would all say, mm -hmm, yes, that happens. That happens all the time. It happens every single day. I teach a professional selling course at a local university here. And I actually opened up my LinkedIn to show them and <laughs> the students were astonished. I had three whole pages of people just pitching people whose uh, <laughs> LinkedIn requests I hadn't even accepted yet where they're like, have you ever, do you want to buy? I bet you're the person responsible for what's your budget for. And it's like, whoa, you wouldn't <laughs> not ask somebody on a date before you started saying you want to get married. <laughs> so that's one of the things you want to think about with LinkedIn is build authentic relationships because it's really about the quality and not the quantity, right? So how can we make sure that our LinkedIn profiles are really optimized? I'm going to show you a couple of examples of ones that I think are really, really nice that you can use for inspiration. And, and we will share this uh, PowerPoint, this Google slide deck with you afterwards too. So you can use this in combination with the um, swag LinkedIn checklist that JB is going to share with you. So one, your profile picture. Let's talk about that. Your profile picture, it has to be professional, but it can also be authentically you, right? So you can be yourself in this picture. One of the things I love the most about Phil's picture is he's got these signature orange glasses, right? He loves to be colorful. That's just part of his authentic brand. It's exactly who he is. What you don't wanna have is a blurry picture, an old picture, a picture with you and several other people in it. That's perfect for Facebook. It's not perfect for LinkedIn because if somebody calls me on the phone and I go look at them on LinkedIn, I want to see exactly who they are and what they're like so that I know, you know, how I can start making connection with them. The other thing is it's here in the eyes. This is subliminal and subconscious, right? But you, I feel like Phil is looking and smiling right at me. If you look at him, he's got, he's got his eyes right on you. So we don't have to be coy. You know, let somebody see your eyes because this is often the first introduction to you. Now, hiring aside, because there are some very serious legal issues <laughs> surrounding people looking at somebody who's applying for a job before they've uh, had the proper sort of hiring channels. But whenever we're dealing with building relationships, you definitely want to be able to see somebody's face and look into their eyes. So look at your profile picture, your background photo. And that's this thing kind of up top. A lot of people ignore that. And that is killer real estate for you. 
You can put, if you're really artistic, you want to put a beautiful picture up there, you can do that. If you've got a message you want to send, you can create that. Really easy to find what that um, area is so that you can say, okay, I want to create something. You can make one for free on canva.com. That's my favorite place to go to make easy free graphics. And you can put whatever message you want to in that background photo. So don't forget about that. So if you're looking for jobs, great place to say, you know, marketing specialist in Salesforce, looking for a job, put that out there if you want to. So use that background photo to your advantage. Your headline. Now look at Phil's working with companies to increase their revenue right away. You know exactly what Phil does. Here is my warning for you. If you change your job, you change your job title, LinkedIn wants you to automatically default that headline to your title. So if you change your job, pay attention because there will be a pop-up that says, do you want to change your headline to marketing specialist, Salesforce certified? So pay attention to that because the headline's a really great place for you to say, this is the subtitle about me. If the book about you is your LinkedIn page and you're saying right on there, here's my name, this is your subtitle. It's a great place for you to say, here's the value that I can bring or here's a little something about me. So when we look at this, you can see Phil likes to help people increase revenue. So he works in BD and he puts his personality in there by saying he's a pinball wizard, which is pretty funny and gives you a good opening conversation for him. And he loves good food and strong coffee. Next to Phil's name, do you see that teeny tiny little, there's a little um, sort of announcement speaker. This is a really cool function that you can use either to tell somebody what your name is pronounced like. So if you have a name that you want to share your name pronunciation, but it also gives you enough time that you can create a little greeting there. So this is something it's a little secret. Not a lot of people know about. It's something really cool that you can change so that people can hear your voice and you can either say, this is how I pronounce my name or here's my name and something a little bit about me. Now you can also put a summary in there. Um, and I want to point out, Mark Jones did say he likes that Phil's header has his email in there. It is little, it is helpful. And it says, Phil says, I'm open to your connection. Please send me an email. I love it. So um, when you're looking at your summary, you can say, here are some things that are about me. You want to make sure you're putting in search friendly words. So one of the things Salesforce has been teaching us really, really clearly in the past three years is it's so good to have a niche, right? So you don't want to say, I do Salesforce <laughs> because nobody does all of Salesforce, right? Salesforce is just so big. So you want to be able to say, here's exactly what I do. I'm a Pardot specialist. I love marketing campaigns and I really enjoy where marketing communications meets marketing technology or whatever your specific niche is. Put that in there. Those words become search friendly. So if somebody's looking for a freelance contractor or a full-time end user, Salesforce marketing specialist, they'll be able to find you because your words say so specifically what you are and what you do. Next, down here on the bottom, you see this providing services. So Phil's put his in there. You know right away, he does demand gen, he does lead gen, he does executive coaching. You know what he's up to. So use that too, because those again are searchable both in LinkedIn and on your search engines like Google. Okay, recommendations, you're going to see this in the checklist that JB has to share with you, where, um, you know, recommendations are a big social proof. And that's a lot of what LinkedIn is, right? It's about social proof. Whereas there's some room for collateral on content. I'm going to show you that too, because that is a really underutilized piece. I want to show you really quickly Mario Martinez, because I think his, if you've ever met Mario, this is very Mario, but I think this is beautiful because he's using this concept of storytelling. Again, I'm not telling a marketing group anything they don't know about storytelling, but humans love stories. We have since before the, in, the, the paper was even invented, right? People love stories. So Mario starts his off by saying, I had a dream. That dream came true on June 20th, 2017, and I'm already hooked. So don't use this about section the same way you would use the opening of your resume, right? Where you're like, process oriented leader who's used to multitasking. Okay, that's not fun. Everybody says that, right? So make this part really about you. Let your personality shine through. One of the things we all know about the Salesforce ecosystem is like big personalities are good. So share yourself here. Don't be afraid to do that. 
you know, put that in here. So Mario's I love because it does show you exactly how he sees himself, how he wants you to see him and the things that he can bring to the table if the two of you start to develop a relationship. Okay, so Lori Richardson, she's got here something I want to talk to you all about. Right in the middle, you can see all of these sort of things that she thinks she does well. Sales process, new business development, Probably about seven or eight years ago, these were huge on LinkedIn. LinkedIn was asking you to give people these endorsements every day, and people were sort of doing it as a scratch your back, you scratch mine sort of thing. They too are optimized for search. So if I wanted to find somebody who was a specialist in sales process, if Lori's got over 99 people saying she does it well, she's going to pop up at the top of my search. These are still important but they're becoming a little more arduous to fill out, right? So if I wanted to go say, hey, I think Lori's great at sales process and I click that button where before it used to just let me leave that sort of thumbs up. Now I have to say, how long have I known Lori? What role was Lori in when we were doing this thing together? And so I sort of predict that we're gonna see these start to roll away. All right, Mark Jones, you've got a question about um, how you would tailor your summary if you're enrolled that straddles a lot of areas. Okay, solo admin. One, I would start with that. Everybody loves, respects, cherishes, and understands all of the pains a solo admin goes through, right? So I would probably start with that, Mark, and say solo admin, period. You've heard of it. Maybe you've been it. Here are some of the things that a solo admin does, and here are some of the things that I do well, right? So maybe you're not a specialist in automation, but you've done automation. So you will say, as a solo admin, I think really hard about when to use automation and when to use one-on-one -on -one training, when to encourage my end users to, you know, so you can sort of build it in that way. Or if you've got a favorite um, movie, you know, if you say, um, <laughs> you know, Cameron Crowe's Singles, when you think of singles, you start singing Temple of the Dog. When I think of singles, I think of myself as a solo admin, right? So like allow your sort of personality to come through there, Mark, and say, being a solo admin is, I think, the toughest job in the ecosystem. And you're right. While it's hard to specialize, it allows you to be this generalist in so many areas. So put it out there in a way that people are like, I totally get who Mark Jones is and exactly what he does. In the recommendation section, um, these are great. And this is one of those places where I tell you giving is better than receiving, right? We have to plant our seeds before our trees grow. So a lot of times people will send me um, requests and say, hey, can you give me a recommendation? I'd be happy to if I can truthfully do so, but give me a little more information. Are you applying for a new job? Are you applying for a promotion? Is there a big job out there that you're trying to win as a freelancer? So I know how to sort of use the tone and tenor of my recommendation to help you get to where you want to go. If you've had a really great experience with somebody, leave them a recommendation, right? I'll tell you guys something about Rhythm. Rhythm reached out to me one time and said, hey, Shannon, um, I was in this meeting that you were in and you said these three things that sounded interesting to me. Can we have an informational interview? And then Rhythm shared all of the things that he was going through in his Salesforce journey. Now, I would be able to say very explicitly, you know, I know that Rhythm is a go-getter. I know that he's not afraid for to ask for things that he wants, right? So those sorts of things point out what somebody can do for you, but look for ways that you can leave recommendations. This is not dissimilar to a Google review or a Yelp review. And I know you all use those, right? So if you can give somebody a recommendation, do it. It's really nice to do. All right. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk to you about on LinkedIn is how you can continue to optimize your presence with collateral. So um, this lady, Holly Joy McElwain, she uh, wrote a book. And when she wrote her book, she said, I'm going to use LinkedIn to help feature parts of my book. So she used this featured piece and this is running across the middle of your LinkedIn profile. You don't have to have written a book to put something in your featured piece, right? You might have done a really beautiful implementation where you can share some pictures. Maybe you've developed something in your dev org that's really cool or clever that you want to share. Maybe you have a really small tip. Um, on a PDF that you've written, you don't have to have something that you're like, well, I've got something to sell because it doesn't have to be like that. Look for ways that you can use this featured piece 
to your advantage. So some people will put their resume in here. Some will put projects that they've worked on, but I want you to think about this because this is a really underutilized piece of the overall LinkedIn real estate, right? So look at that sort of featured piece so that you can say, here are some, th some things that you can know that I can share so that you understand how I deliver value. Because really guys, that's what LinkedIn is about. Like giving value to others. And I know the Salesforce ecosystem, the Ohana is so good about giving. We're all so good at giving. So put it here, right? Because you may be second level connected to somebody who you're like, wow, I saw that person. I heard of that person. I want to connect with that person. You want to be able to show what kind of value you can give because really that's what developing relationships is about. I mean, it comes from a place of sincerity, right? So use that there. Um, goodness gracious. Thank you, Rhythm. <laughs> so look for ways that you can use this featured piece to call out some things that you've done that are amazing. Salesforce also gives us really good ways to do this through Trailhead, right? Like they'll sometimes put out ways that we can work on. Um, oh, remember last year they had like boards that we could build together, portfolios that you could build. Call those out here, put them here. Because really what you want this page to be is, is a sort of scrolling page that says, here are the things that I know, the things that I can share and the ways that I can bring value to you. All right. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about the platform differences. So <laughs> social media is just a plural of social medium, right? And a medium is something that carries information from one person or place to another. So there's a list here and you can see there are loads of social media logos and some of them you probably recognize and some of them you don't, but they're mostly all in play. I think a few of them might have sort of burned out over the pandemic. But one of the things that I want you to really think specifically about, and this is a Covey, this is a Stephen Covey thing. I didn't make this up, but I think about it all of the time is begin with the end in mind. What is the outcome that you want? from the platform you're using and the way that you're using it, right? If you're on Facebook, you're probably using Facebook to share pictures of the things that you're doing, the people that you're hanging out with, the places you're going. Facebook's a really good way to keep in touch with people who are like, hey, wonder what Bill hooten has been up to for the last year. You know, hey, I wonder what Arlene Chen is up to today. I want to, you know, go over there and see what's going on with her cute little dog. So Facebook is a place where you are very personal. Um, if you think about um, some of the other specific social media platforms, I mean, Twitter is huge for Salesforce. The Salesforce Twitter community is amazing and I love it. And that's a really good place to say like, oh, I just had a quick thought about this or what do you guys think about Einstein Analytics now being called Tableau CRM? It's a good place to have really short, quick interactions about things that are super timely and topical. LinkedIn is a little more forever. Okay. So I've seen people share things on LinkedIn that make me scratch my head. Like, Whoa, why would you put that on LinkedIn? <laughs> that is a crazy thing to put on LinkedIn because now you're making people say, do I want to do business with this person? Right? Because even though we're saying we want work-life balance and we want work-life harmony and during the pandemic, it's all turned into one big smudge, right? <laughs> we're working all the time because we don't really leave our houses. LinkedIn is still about work. LinkedIn is about work. So putting things on there that are potentially dangerous, that are potentially pitfalls, that are very personal, that is something I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm telling you to think hard about what the end in mind is. What is the desired outcome that you have there? You know, what good is going to come out of your personal presence and your personal brand if you share this particular thing on LinkedIn, right? So think really hard about that. Now, all of these social media platforms have algorithms. Every one of them has algorithms and they're constantly twiddling with them, right? They're always changing. Here's what we want people to see and here's what we think is going to happen next, okay? So I wanna to talk to you just a little bit about the LinkedIn algorithm. So LinkedIn does not share their algorithm very often. <laughs> So this one, I'm going to tell you, I think it's the most recent one, but we all know technology because we all work in it. So LinkedIn is constantly tweaking their algorithm because they want to make it sticky for their users, right? 
JB mentioned uh, for a very short amount of time at the beginning, uh, yes, I got my PhD this year in uh, Salesforce user adoption. So I'm constantly thinking about stickiness. How do we make things more sticky for our users and how we do that? When we say user adoption, what we really mean user acceptance. Do they accept this and do they keep using it? And I can tell you something, all the social media platforms that you use are monetized, so they want you to use it as much as possible. So that's what this algorithm's doing, right? It's saying, how do I make sure, how can I ensure that Mark Jones and Terrence Coffey are using LinkedIn as much as they possibly can? Because we want to charge the people who want to put sponsored ads as much as we possibly can, right? So it is like traditional advertising on a social platform. Let me tell you a little bit about this. So first there's content creation. If you're not creating content on LinkedIn, try it out. You know, the long form blog posts are great because again, they feed back into our friend Google. So it's searchable. You can start to create content there. If you feel excited about a topic and you know somebody else shares your excitement, create a blog post with them. It's pretty easy to do, right? It's a nice way for you to say, it's almost like you have your own free WordPress site. And, and it's really searchable. So you want to create some content, look for ways that you can put articles in there. You want to share posts and LinkedIn is immediately going to say, let us score the quality of this content, right? We know how this works. So they're going to look to say, is your content any good? And how they're looking to see if your content is any good. They are looking at things like spelling. So they're looking to see if you've spelled things correctly. They're looking at variation of sentence lengths, right? So when you put that period or that full stop, do you have some that are really long and complex? Do you have some that are really short? Is it one total run on paragraph or have you got some breaks inside of there? Do you include some pictures or images or GIFs or links to YouTube videos? They're looking at that sort of variety in your content. Again, don't freak out about this. You know, the first time you do this, the first time you put something out there, if you're saying, Mark, if you're like, I want to improve the way that I'm using LinkedIn, do not, please do not let perfection be the enemy of progress here. Put one out there, let it fly. Let us all give you some likes and some you know comments on there so we can keep ratcheting up in the algorithm. And then you'll say, here's how I can do the next one better, right? So LinkedIn's looking at that to say, do we want to show this in everybody's feed or do we want to let it sort of sit there? They're looking at whether or not they continue to display it. Remember I told you at the very top of this call, you've got the ability in the top right hand corner of your feed to toggle between top and recent. So if it's something that keeps getting interaction and engagement, they're going to keep pushing it up to the top, right? So that algorithm's like, hey, this is a piece of content people like. It's working. They're going to keep monitoring if it's liked, if it's viewed, if somebody's hidden it, if they flagged it as inappropriate, and they'll keep measuring that piece of content. Again, whether it's a long form blog post or if it's something that you just shared, and then it's going to continue to look for its virality potential. So that's how LinkedIn's algorithm is working in terms of saying like, do I want to keep showing this before? So um please again feel free to snap a picture of this i'll wait one second if you want to snap a picture of it if you want to take a screenshot of this it, this is hard to find they do not put this right out there and say here's our algo works <laughs> um you'll also get these slides you'll have it later too so i think about the algorithm a lot because i'm like you know it's not so much am i trying to trick the algo because i don't I don't care about that, that robot. What I care about is making sure that I'm giving value to people. So if the algorithm doesn't favor it, people probably won't too. It means that people aren't, aren't feeding it by saying, Hey, this was something of good value that's been shared. Right? So the other thing I want to tell you about right now is sharing. One of the things that, um, I think a lot about is, you know, when you're providing value to other people, how much of that involves self-promotion? Self-promotion is challenging for people. I know that JB had Amy Opplinger on in one of these earlier sessions. And if you weren't there live, definitely go to her YouTube channel and watch Amy's session on imposter syndrome because we all have it. We all have that little voice in our head telling us like, yeah, maybe you're not good enough for this. You tell that voice, be quiet, <laughs> Shh, 
I don't want you inside of my headspace right now because you should occasionally be promoting things that you've done really well. If you passed a new certification, if you did really well on a super badge, if you found out some cool little hack or trick or secret, or you found a little gray area that you want to let people know about, put it out there. But it shouldn't be all that you do. So I've seen a couple of different commercial studies. They're not academic studies, but I think they're good. That say you should have a ratio of sort of three to one. So you should be sharing and promoting three pieces of other people's information that you find to be valuable. And then one where you're sort of self promoting, right? So if you've read an article that's really great, you know, other people will benefit from, or you see an event that's coming up that you want to share, look for ways that you can sort of use that three to one principle so you can keep delivering value that isn't all self-centered. All right. So Amy Volus, who's, you know, one of the things I love the best about LinkedIn is there are people that you can follow without necessarily um, adding them to your LinkedIn platform. Amy is somebody that is really amazing to follow because she is so good at delivering value to her audience. She is so good at delivering value. One of the things that I wanted to tell you about Amy is she shared this. You can see when I took this screenshot, she had shared it a week earlier. I saw it because I'm connected to Amy. But then a week later, Trish Bertuzzi commented on it, which brought it right back up into my feed. So I got to see it again. Okay. So she shared some information from Morgan Ingram. She appropriately tagged him in this post. Please be careful about putting something up and then tagging a hundred people under it and saying like, what do you think? Um, because that feels spammy and LinkedIn will devalue that sort of content. But when it's appropriate to tag somebody in, tag them in. So make sure that you aren't sort of spamming people or spamming the feed. So don't overuse your app mentions. Don't overpost daily because the algorithm will start to not favor that. And, and so will your connections. Make sure you're using relevant hashtags because hashtags are, we're sort of late. LinkedIn was a little late to the hashtag game, but it's here now. They actually are starting to auto suggest hashtags to you. So if you start to type something, it will be like, do you want to tag in Salesforce? <laughs> so if it's appropriate, use that hashtag, right? It helps you find that content later. It helps people that might be interested in that content, find it and make sure that you're staying on topic and on brand. Um, if you're posting something and you want people to engage, having a call to action is great. It's pretty easy to say, you know, like, what do you think about this? Or, you know, posting a question that sort of asks people to get back involved. And if you've watched anybody who's a YouTuber, they're really great at this because they'll say to you, you know, do you like the cheesecake or do you like the chocolate chip cookies better? Put your comments down below and people do it. And that's one of the things that I would encourage you to think about. Like if it's appropriate for you to have a call to action. And again, you're a group of professional marketers. You know about this. Um, if it's appropriate to have a call to action, put it in there. You know, help people understand how to engage with you. And if you can narrow it down, there's something called Hicks Law. And Hicks Law says, if you give people too many choices, they'll sort of freeze, they'll go into that analysis paralysis state and they won't do anything at all. So while you do want to help give an open-ended question, if you say something like cheesecake or chocolate chip cookies, it's really easy for people to engage because they know exactly what you want from them. But if you say, you know, what's your favorite dessert of all time? It may take them a little bit longer because I don't know about you guys. I love every dessert. <laughs> I don't desert discriminate. <laughs> so look for ways that you can have a call to action that calls for people to engage. Okay, this is my challenge for you before we get to the part where you can ask some questions is look at your personal social selling audit. Now, again, please do not think this is a quantity game because it isn't a big cornerstone of this is developing relationships, right? So if you're a business, um, if you're a business, it may be a little bit different if you're representing your business brand, but your personal brand, you're looking for really quality connections because you want to be able to deliver value to them. And also think about what sort of social selling um, or social media platforms make sense for you. It may not make sense for you to be on Pinterest. It may not make sense for you to be on Instagram. You know, go to the places that make sense where you can develop relationships. You don't have to be on all of them. And in fact, you probably shouldn't be on all of them. For me, 
I spend almost all of my time on Twitter and LinkedIn because that's where my peeps are, right? I get to learn so much because people are putting things that they know about Salesforce, they've seen about Salesforce, that they find interesting about Salesforce. And that's where I see the most of it on LinkedIn and Twitter. And that's where I feel like, wow, okay, this is where my tribe is. And I want to go where my tribe is. You know, that's where I want them to be. Um, okay, so <laughs> Tatiana, you love dark chocolate. Me too, girl. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Mark's got a question. What do you think about saving posts? I sometimes do it if I want to engage with something after I put a bit more thought on or if I want to refer to it at a little point. Yes, Mark. Brilliant. All right, y'all. You know in Salesforce how you can bookmark uh, something in Chatter and you can go back later to your bookmarked? You can do that on LinkedIn as well. So definitely save posts. If you see something, if you're scrolling through because you've got like two minutes before your next meeting and you're like, oh, it doesn't make sense for me to get into something else. You know, I want to look at this, save it so you can engage with it later. That is a really good best practice, Mark. I'm glad that you brought it up. And guess what? If it's like that post I showed you before with Amy and Trish and it pops back up a week later because you've saved it, Mark, and now it's going to get a little bit additional engagement, that's perfect. That's good stuff. All right. LinkedIn provides a way to personalize our URL. So thank you for bringing this up, Rafina. I think this is really good. So when you are looking at your LinkedIn URL, look for a way that you can make sure that it's personalized to you because they won't automatically default to your name. So um, this one is very long, but it tells me exactly what you do. You're a MarTech consultant. You're a certif certified Salesforce marketing cloud consultant. So you can look at that URL as a way to say, how do I make sure that I'm branding myself? Because when we hop on these calls, which are amazing, right? This is such a good byproduct of the pandemic where a bunch of friends from all around the globe can get together instead of us all, you know, being in Phoenix with JB, we can be everywhere. Um, and we're always saying, hey, share your LinkedIn. Let's connect on LinkedIn. Please connect to me on LinkedIn. When you've got a URL that tells a little bit about you, that's pretty cool. All right, is just increasing your network count a measure of how good you are or will be on LinkedIn? Oh, thank you for asking that question. Mwah. That is one of my favorite questions. No way. <laughs> Please make sure that your network is focused because what you should be thinking about is not like, wow. You know, when I see people that are like 80,000 connections on LinkedIn, I'm like, okay, well, that's like having 80,000 kids. Like you don't know their names. You don't know what foods they're allergic to. Like that's crazy to me. Find a network that is driven by quality so that you can provide value. So, you know, like, let's say I'm looking at my LinkedIn network and I can say right away, okay, I see Shristi's asking question here on LinkedIn and She's saying, hey, I'm looking for somebody to help me out with a quick project that I have. Does anyone know somebody that can specifically work on Pardot for the next three months? I can immediately think of 12 people because I'm like, ah, ha, ha. I know the people that are doing that because I have a tight enough network where I know who the people are and what they're doing inside of there. So don't just go out there like a crazy person and say like, I'm going to add everybody. <laughs> um, I actually got a request this week that I thought was really interesting. And I left this sitting in my inbox so I could watch it. Um, a woman sent me a request and she said, Hey Shannon, how would you like to get 500 leads a day? Please hit reply so that you can get them. And her title, her little tagline said <laughs> bus operator. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. And the next day it said educational assistant and she changed it every single day. So I could tell what she was doing was finding people in those industries, making it look like she worked there and then trying to give them 500 leads a day, right? So this idea of authenticity is so, so important and people can see right through it if you're not being authentic. So um, a question here about the significance of recommendations and skills. Yes, this is perfect. So one of the things that I love the best about Salesforce, I know I've said that like, eight times today, right? <laughs> I'm obsessed with Salesforce, you guys. I'll just be honest. I think most of you are as well. Uh, but one of the things I love the best about Salesforce is this ecosystem is that people work together. So even though I am a Salesforce consultant, I don't have true competitors, right? I've got loads of partners who will call me in when they need change management or training and say, Hey, I, we need your help on this. We, we really need you in on this piece. I've got people that I'll call in and say, 
Hey, really need some help. I've got a client who needs field service lightning. I don't do that in my shop. So one of the things I would tell you to do is put the things that you're good at in those recommendations. Because sometimes if I'm like, whoa, I've got an opportunity for field service lightning. My client wants it to be easy. They want it all to be papered on one thing, but they're fine with me bringing in another partner. I'll just sort of go type that in, see who's got field service lightning in their recommendations or skills, right? So this significance is really critical if you are trying to get hired for a job, if you're trying to find a partner. So spend the time building that out and building it up, right? So if it's something that you're really good at, put it in there. If you're a solo admin, that's okay. Put in the things that you feel like you are pretty good at, right? And I think when you're saying like, hey, I took Spanish for nine years. Could I have a really deep conversation about a movie in Spanish? No. Could I help us get along if we were in a situation where we were like, okay, we need to help cross this language barrier? Probably. Um, I did judge a dance competition about 10 years ago in Mexico and did the best I could. <laughs> um, so, you know, if it's something where you're like, I'm probably not that great at it. Think about like whether you're willing to learn more about it, pull more on it or say like, I'm intermediate at this sort of thing. You know, honesty is the best policy, right? That is the best policy. Um, Mark had something similar this week in his DMs. Somebody was trying to sell their course on flow. I'll tell you guys, if your first thing is you're trying to sell in somebody's inbox, that's not bringing value and authenticity, right? So that's always the thing like, Somebody might be able to deliver value to you, but you also want to think about how you deliver value to them because this is a, this is a two way street. One of the other things I'm constantly telling the students in my professional selling class is, you guys probably know this. You've got two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? Like that is the right ratio. You should be listening at least two times as much as you talk. And that's the same sort of thing on LinkedIn delivering value, delivering value before you ask a, a request of somebody, um, unless you say like, hey, here's something I'm really hoping you can help me with and I wanna be able to help you in the future. So please keep me in mind. All right, I know we're coming close to our time and I see JB is off of mute. So let me see if there are any final questions because I know I just gave you a lot of information at once. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> A lot. I really appreciate that, Shannon. Um, I really learned a lot of things which I didn't know before. Uh, one main thing is the at mentions and including them at the appropriate places. I always used to put it at the end. And also one other thing I learned recently is not to include the links to external uh, platforms. Um, so I always include them within the post. But then later I learned that uh, that uh, reduces the chance of engagement. So we have to post them separately in the comments. That, that that's one thing which was helpful um yeah they, that was a lot <laughs> thank thank you for sharing all the tips i will be sharing the slide deck and uh, the success checklist in a few minutes and i see a few of the questions asked by mark before um so on the linkedin profile um what kind of achievements or what kind of uh, uh trailhead accomplishments that we can include um maybe about the certification super badges and anything that we can include Mar mark if you want to unmute yourself and throw more details into it please feel free to do so i said mark uh, he has some issue with the background noise <laughs> at least uh, you can that's it's fine now we had a, there was a, a funeral that was on tv in the background when, at the beginning um no so kind of it was like Obviously, you can put things in like your skills and your kind of your, your certifications and all of that on LinkedIn. But it was more kind of like, what's the what's the opinion on like? Because obviously, Trailhead has so many different things. You've got like the certifications, the super badges, modules, projects, uh, trails. You know, it's kind of like what would be what opinion would there be on what of that should you include? Because I can imagine if you put everything on or that you achieve on Trailhead. I could come across as potentially quite a spammy approach. That's kind of what my thinking was, which. It's such a good question, Mark. And I think use that Stephen Covey thing, begin with the end in mind. So what do you want people to know you for, right? So I've done plenty of badges on data security, but I sure as heck don't ever want anybody to ask me a question on it because it's not something I specialize in. It's not some, you know, I understand it as much as I need to, right? So um, one of the ones I love is that trailhead module. That's the Peter Drucker 
It's kind of like a mini MBA in a trailhead module. So that one I put on my LinkedIn because I was like, I loved it and I want people to know it. And it makes sense for me because I like dealing with business strategy. So think about how you want people to think about you. So if you've done a super badge that's on something that you're like, yep, that's something I want to do all the time. I love it. This is part of my Salesforce passion. Definitely put it up there. Also, you know, link to your trailblazer profile, right? Because if somebody's curious, if I'm like, hey, I wonder, you know, where Mark's at, you know, is he a ranger? Has he done a lot of things on field service lightning? I can go look at it myself, right? So put the things that match what you want the outcome to be in terms of how you're branding yourself. And there's another question, if you don't mind sharing, what, what does your SSI look like? Oh yeah, so my SSI, I had on the, um, let me see if I can bring it back up. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. I had that on, well, I don't know where it's gone on my Google Chrome. Here we go. Uh, do you see my slides now? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. So my SSI is an 83 out of 100 and it says I'm in the top 1% in my industry. I don't know what industry exactly they think I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but again, you know, for me, it's not so much about that composite score because I feel like that's a little bit of a vanity metric for me. I look at it once a quarter to look at these four components to say, where can I do a little better? And if you look at this one right here, it says I can do a little better at engage with insights. So I need to be spending 10 to 15 minutes a day engaging with other people's posts because that's my weakest sort of area. So Mark has a question on the SSI front. What do you think is the good score? I think the, the good score is one that feels good to you. So, you know, if you've got a 12, that's okay. If last quarter you had a four and you've spent time saying, I want to find the right people and I want to engage with insights, right? So I think instead of looking at it to say like, we know what a good BMI is and we know what a good cholesterol level is because good is really quantifiable in those areas. I think here, don't beat yourself up and be like, well, I want to have a 58% or above because who cares? It's really about saying, am I doing the right things? Am I building the right things so that I can have relationships of value? That's wonderful. I had a quick question, if I can. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Shan, firstly, thanks so much for all the value you provided in this session. Really helpful. I did not know about SSI and quite a few things that you shared. So thank you so much for that. Um, so for those of us who are early in their Salesforce journeys and not really sure of the specialization that we sort of the niche that you mentioned earlier, uh, how do we approach this whole creating, you know, the LinkedIn, our own LinkedIn net network, so to say, if you're not sure if it's going to be CPQ or financial services, or any other so how do we approach it just shall we just cast a wider net initially or like how do we go about it i think there's you know the power is in your truth and i think you rhythm you have a really good story i think how you came into salesforce is a really good story and i think most of us accidentally came into salesforce right um you know thankfully for these students now the talent alliance in salesforce is really introducing salesforce at the university level so we're going to see that next gen where people specifically set out to be in salesforce but most of us didn't right so yeah. i think rhythm you can tell a story by saying you know um, I, rhythm you know this is a cool name here's some things about me this is this is something that i know here's how i ended up in salesforce tell your sort of trailblazer story and then say i'm still new to the salesforce ecosystem i'm a little bit interested in financial services i'm a little bit interested in cpq as you can tell i like things that are sort of left in logical leaning in terms of process um i'd love to connect with you so that i can hear a little bit more about the things you know in those areas as i continue to develop what is my ultimate specialty right so just be honest about where you are right now because you're always going to find somebody who can help you with that sort of thing right like somebody might say Hey Rhythm, here's some things I know about CPQ. Um, do you want to see this, or I'll set, I'll share this with you. Give somebody a little bit of an ability to share value with you, right? Um, I think I think that one will be really helpful if you can say, "Here's my trailblazer story." Right. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks, Shannon. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't see anything else. Yeah, if anybody want to share your thoughts, 
you are welcome to do so i have shared the slide deck and the uh, success checklist in the chat window i will also share the recording on the youtube channel and will link these documents to the youtube channel and shannon has her linkedin uh, in the chat window be sure to follow and that was a wonderful session today shannon i'm really glad that we could bring this together and they, i'm sure this is going to be helpful for many um even if anybody has missed this session the recording is all out there they can go back and check the recording and thank you everyone for joining us today and we have the upcoming session by bradley uh, about um, how to get into the freelancing world and i'm sure that's going to be helpful as well and thanks again for joining and um, hope you have a wonderful weekend thank you jb for everything that you do for the salesforce community you are a star <laughs> thank you shannon it's always a pleasure thanks everyone bye hope to see you in the next session <laughs>